just bought a brand new sim rig. Maybe it's a Logitech G920, maybe it's a Thrustmaster T300, or maybe it's the upcoming Fanatec CSL DD. Check my affiliate links down below. And you're having the time of your life. Gran Turismo Sport, iRacing, Assetto Corsa, or anything in between, you're having an absolute blast. But you're realizing one fundamental truth. You're bloody slow. Worry not though, fellow sim racer, because this video is here to cure all that ails you. Believe it or not, our search begins from the foundations up, so we have to focus on the actual setup. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean the car setup or the game setup, but the setup of absolutely everything, starting with your sim rig. Now, there's a priority order here, and it may not be what you expect it to be. First, you need a cockpit that's rigid. That is to say, minimal flex. That is to say, ideally, not bolted to your table with really flimsy pedals that you just kind of push around with your feet with carpet spikes that don't really work. If you can, if your budget allows for it, you want something to bolt the sim rig to that's not going to rumble around, that's not going to get swayed around as you push and exert against the forces that it's pushing against you. So what you'll want is a dedicated standalone sim rig if one meets your budget that'll have all the different sim rig components bolt onto it, not flex, and allow you to exert as much force as you need to without worrying about breaking anything in your room. Some of the easiest starting points are some of the lawn chair-esque, all-in-one kind of sim rigs that are foldable. They're okay, they'll, they'll handle it up until a certain point, but you're not going to be bolting something like load cell pedals on there, so it definitely has a limited lifespan and as far as it can possibly take you. The next one up from there is some of the steel rigs like what I use, like the Next Level Racing GT Track. That's relatively flex-free. You can bolt direct drive componentry on there with load cell pedals, and the flex is relatively minimal and allows you to compete without actually hindering your performance all that much. Now, finally, if you're made of money like some of the sim racing channels out there, you can get an aluminium or aluminum, depending where you are, profile rig that'll basically not flex whatsoever. You can bolt whatever you want onto it in any arrangement whatsoever and basically create a faux car cockpit in your room. This is the idyllic circumstance because it takes away all the flex and it takes away all of the barriers to your development because you can keep bolting on better and better and better pieces of sim hardware as you develop as a driver. Speaking of bolting on high quality hardware, believe it or not, your next port of call is not actually to bolt on something like a direct drive wheel instead of your Logitech G920. What you want to be focusing on instead is the pedals, believe it or not. Above all, the brake pedal. The brake pedal, and especially the trail braking technique, which we'll get into later, relies on extremely precise adjustment of the brake pressure. Load cell pedals, rather than working on distance, work on the amount of pressure. So instead of having a set range that you can work to with a very soft spring, usually with the lower end wheels, what you have is a very, very firm pedal that can take up to anywhere up to 130 kilos of force, in case you have bodybuilder legs, to actually finely adjust the brake in very, very small increments, getting you to precisely apex into corners. This can quite legitimately save you seconds of time per lap and is the second most important thing after having a flexless cockpit. Point number three, force feedback. This one is really, really important. Now, unfortunately, I don't have all the time in the world to guide you through every possible wheelbase permutation with every sim out there because that would take weeks. What we can do is go over some of the basics to hopefully equip you with the knowledge to dial in any given wheelbase for any given sim on the market. So, the main distinction we want to make is, are you using a gear or belt-driven wheelbase or a higher-end direct-driven one? Because that's going to determine how you dial it in. When it comes to the more accessible gear and belt-driven ones, what your limiting factor is, is the linearity of the motor. So it will have a sweet spot. In the case of my old Thrustmaster T500RS, that was the 60% overall strength in the control panel. The more I moved away from that, the more the motor delineated from its nominal operating window. So you want to make sure that the motor is as linear as possible because that way you're ensuring that you're getting the forces in the proportions that the sim racing developer intended you to get them. When it comes to the higher end direct driven wheelbases, this isn't so much of a concern because they tend to be fairly linear across the board. Our secondary consideration and our primary one with the direct driven wheelbases is the integrity of the force feedback signal itself. So in the case of a gear or belt driven wheelbase, what we would do is adjust the gain in the control panel to be at the linear optimum and then adjust on a per game basis to get the strength that we want for our personal driving style. 
In the case of direct-driven wheelbases, this is slightly different. What we want to safeguard first is the integrity of that signal. You can think of a force feedback signal much as an audio one. There is a ceiling, there is a noise floor, and there's a signal in between. What you're looking to do, much as with audio, is to maximize the level of that signal as high as possible to get it as high resolution as possible without actually clipping the ceiling. Because if you clip the ceiling, what happens is that you chop and truncate the waveform and you lose detail. You definitely don't want to be doing that. So a really good way to set that up is to look at whatever telemetry tool is offered to you by your given SIM. In the case of ACC here, in the bottom right readout, there is a faint gray bar showing you the amount of force feedback being output to the wheel at any given point in time. What you want to do is find a high speed corner, drive it in a fairly high downforce car and try to clip a curb midway through that. That's going to generate a force that's very, very high. And if you clip during that process, while hitting the curb, you know that the force feedback gain is slightly too high and you simply grab it and drag it back. In the case of ACC, which I have booted up here, the gain you would want to be anywhere from about 50 to 60% to create the maximum signal to noise ratio without actually clipping the signal itself. So now that our gain is all set, we move on to the second most important setting. In the case of the gear and the belt driven wheels, this one is critical. Minimum force overcomes the forces needed to overcome the inertia of the moving parts in your gear or belt driven wheelbase to actually generate some of those low level forces. You'll notice that if you have this all the way down at zero on a lower end wheelbase, you simply won't feel any road texture, curb texture, or any finer details like that. That's because of this. In a wheelbase like my Thrustmaster T500RS or the T300, a minimum force at about 8% tends to be idyllic because it brings up that detail without bringing too much of the coarseness and the noise that you get as well. You may need to experiment with this for your particular wheelbase, but generally speaking, it's probably going to be anywhere between about 6 and 10%. It should be said that for direct driven wheelbases, you don't need to use minimum force whatsoever. You run it at zero because there's no inertia to overcome. The shaft is connected directly to the motor itself. And after this, let's say that we're using something like a Logitech G920 and we're really not getting that many effects, really not getting that many low forces, textural detail from the tires. Well, what we want to do is artificially boost something like the road effects. So on a direct driven wheelbase, you want to keep this all the way down. You simply don't need this sort of thing unless you personally prefer to drive with extra canned forces. In the lower end wheelbases, you want to turn this up as much as is necessary to inform your driving and to get you where you need to go and allow you to actually make informed moves during the race. That pretty much concludes the bulk of the force feedback setup. Everything else is going to be esoteric or specific to the sim itself. One thing I will mention is that some sims allow for lookup table files. This is a way to basically equate for the non-linearity of your motor. So if you have a lower end wheelbase, you can actually use a tool such as wheel check in order to create a, a linearity curve for your motor, which can then be equated for by the lookup table. With that done, our main consideration that's left is the steering lock on the wheel. Let's say that our steering lock like here is at 720 degrees in game. We want to make sure that's matched in the control panel of the wheelbase itself to make sure that it's a one to one input ratio. So if you're turning 90 degrees, that the on-screen wheel is being turned 90 degrees as well. Furthermore, it depends on a sim by sim basis, but in the case of ACC, it will auto adjust the steering lock to the car that you're driving. In some other sims, such as Dirt Rally 2, it won't do this. So for instance, you want the steering lock that you would get from a modern world rally car, you would have to set the steering lock manually to 540 degrees, then set it to 540 degrees in your respective control panel as well. This is going to depend on a per sim basis, so make sure to read up and understand how the steering lock is handled in your favorite sim. FOV, aka the field of view, a deceptively simple setting which most sim racers dial in wrong all the same. So what is the FOV? It's the viewing angle of your virtual driver's eyes as represented across the flat plane or slightly curved plane of your monitor. This tends to be modified by three main things. The distance that you sit from your monitor, the aspect ratio of your monitor, as well as the overall size of your monitor. General wisdom dictates that the closer you sit to your monitor, the wider the viewing angle can become and the larger the FOV can be. The further you sit from the monitor, the more narrow the FOV has to be. You can see, as I increase the FOV here in Assetto Corsa, we start to get more detail from the periphery of the car, including a wing mirror which is almost becoming usable. Conversely, if I do the opposite, 
and narrow the field of view, we start to get more of a tunnel vision vibe as we get more and more detail from in front of the car, but we reject detail from around the car. One of the advantages of this is that you tend to get a lower sense of speed, allowing you to keep the car under control more naturally, as well as apex and position it more closely to where you want. As a result, lower FOVs tend to be favored for hot lapping style racing. Generally speaking, you want to get a nice middle ground, and the best way to do that is by using the FOV calculator I've included in the description down below to get it absolutely mathematically perfect for your circumstances. Alright kids, let me show you one of the most potent things in all of sim racing, namely the car setup. So we're here in Assetto Corsa Competizione at one of my favourite racetracks in the world, Brands Hatch. The reason I've picked it for this demo is because it's very short and we can get through this test very quickly and I can quickly show you the difference that a good car setup can make even across a very, very short lap. So what we have here is a setup that is the default aggressive in the game. So. If you were just a complete newcomer, that's generally what you would default to. That's what the devs recommend that you default to. I've just loaded the default aggressive. I'll load it up again. And we're not changing a single thing about it. We're here in hot lap mode. We're going to get straight into it. I'm going to show you the balance of the car. Go, go, go. When it's in its default aggressive state. So a lot of my friends don't know very much about car setups. And that is very much to their detriment. As I'm going to show you here... There are a lot of characteristics about cars that you can actually tune out through good setups. So, coming up to T1, break between the two boards, we oversteer in, trying to balance the car on the way down, tons, tons of mid-corner understeer, massive snap oversteer in the corner entry, and again into the hairpin now, car shooting out, lots of mid-corner understeer, but still very squirrely and unstable as we break hard here. Squirrely as we get into the corner, absolutely no rear grip, none at all. Car is so unstable in the rear currently, but still with a dollop of mid-corner understeer, basically just robbing us of time at every possible point in a corner right now. If you were to load this up as a default setup and try it for the first time as a new racer, you would say to yourself, the McLaren 720S just kind of sucks. I don't want to race it. Why well, don't want to race the McLaren 720S when it handles like this? So unstable, so much rotation, but not useful rotation. The car just snaps on you on corner entry, but then mid-corner, massive understeer, like here. As the car becomes weightless over the hill, we're going to try and maximize our time over the line, see what we got. For a very, very paltry 124.9. Now, can you get a lot faster with the default setup than this? Of course you can. That wasn't a perfect run by any stretch, but I also wanted to show you the characteristics endemic to the car with some default setups. And you can see that there are a lot of less than ideal, not really balanced aspects to this setup. So I'm going to move on to a custom setup now and show you the difference between the two. All right, kids, custom setup time. I'm going to let the setup do all the talking for me. Let's do this. Except I'll start talking all the same. <laughs> so... Let's see how this differs from the default aggressive. All right. Oh, immediately it hooks into the first turn. Way better. Almost threw me off how much front end grip I had then. As I work my way up, tires nice and warm now. Brake again in between the two boards. Way more stability on corner entry. That would have spun me out completely in the last setup. Already three tenths up coming into T2, the hairpin braking under control, getting on the power nice and early. So much stability at every point. We're almost a second up already. So much stability through that corner. Can get the rear end out on the power though. Over a second up already, guys. Absolutely brilliant. Now, this is by no means an esports grade min-max setup, but it's something that I've worked on for maybe a little while, maybe an hour or so. It, it, you can see the increased stability. The time just comes has nothing to do with my driving ability at this point. As I go slightly wide there. You can see way more stable when cutting the curb as well. 
be so aggressive when you need to be. And that's what you want with hot lapping. You want a setup that can really let you push it. So much natural rotation mid-corner, but useful rotation, unlike the last setup. Break nice and hard there, as I kind of messed that corner up, unfortunately. Doesn't really matter. I mean, it's not going to be a split one time, but a 122.8 compared to a high 124. Now, can you get it even faster than this? You bet your butt you can. But that is just one small adjustment. That's, well, it's a lot of small adjustments all working and coalescing together, but that is two seconds of gain across a track that has a lap time of about 122, 123. That is a massive gain over the course of a race. And when qualifying, I mean, that will be the difference between you being last and dominating the competition. So setups, absolutely critical. While we can't talk in detail about everything to do with car setups, because that would require a multi-part video series, I'm going to take you guys through some of the very elementary basics that you can keep an eye on just to get you started. Let's talk setups. While we can't get into great detail here, we can go over some of the elementary basics in order to get you to tune the car balance very quickly and get up and running fast. In a sim such as ACC, one of the most important things, if not the most important thing to set right, is the tire pressures. You're aiming for hot tire pressures between 27.5 to 28 psi in a GT3 car. Simply set your tire pressures when they're cold, drive a few laps, take stock of where they are when they're hot, and adjust accordingly. Toe, front toe controls the amount of turn in the car has. Basically, the more aggressive the negative toe, the more the car will turn in, but the more squirrely it will become. Camber allows you to adjust the amount of contact patch of the tire you're able to maintain in contact with the road during hard cornering. You want to set this up so that your tire wear is even from outside to in. Conversely, rear toe is inward toe. Basically, the more that you have, the more you stabilize the rear of the car, but the more you increase the wear on the rear tires. Electronics, traction control. The more traction control you set, the more the traction control interferes with your acceleration. While this will stop you from spinning out, it'll also rob you of precious milliseconds when you're accelerating out of corners. ABS, the more ABS you have on, the more the ABS interferes with your braking. While it will stop you from locking up the tires, it will also interfere more and more and more, effectively increasing your braking distances. Mechanical grip. The balance of the front anti-roll to the rear anti-roll, aka sway bars, determines the, the lateral balance of the car in slower speed corners. The stiffer the rear anti-roll bar in relation to the front, the more oversteery the car will be. The looser the rear anti-roll bar to the front, the more understeery the car will be. Brake bias, probably the second most important quick setting after tire pressures. Brake bias controls the amount of over to understeer feel you get while trail braking into corners. You can really tune the balance of the car very quickly while adjusting the brake bias. Suspension settings, this is very chassis dependent. Generally speaking, the flatter the road surface, the heavier the suspension you want. The more bumpy the road surface, the softer the suspension you want within reason. Stiffer front suspension will tend to stabilize the car during high speed corners, whereas stiffer rear suspension will tend to make the car more loose and oversteery on fast corners. Damper tuning is beyond the purview of this video. It's very, very involved and something I would recommend that you look into in your own time. You can tune dampers very, very methodically in a title such as ACC by using MoTeC in order to get them mathematically perfect. Aerodynamic balance. Generally, GT cars you want to be as low as possible without bottoming out and launching your car off the track. The rear ride height in relation to the front controls the balance of the car when it's coasting and off power. So the higher the rear of the car in relation to the front, the more oversteery and the more rotatey it will be in corners. The lower the rear of the car in relation to the front, the more stable it will be when off power. The rear wing, of course, determines the amount of downforce being generated at the rear of the car. Conversely, the splitter controls how much downforce is being generated at the front of the car. Brake ducts, the shorter the race, the more closed the brake ducts can be. The longer the race, generally the more open you want the brake ducts to be. You want to balance this between slowing the car down and creating aerodynamic drag and overheating the brakes themselves. Okay, kids, the elementary basics of race car driving. We're going to explore them here at Brands Hatch where we've just done our hot laps. So we're going to go over the idyllic line, brake markers, trail braking, 
apexing and then finally accelerating out of corners. So to begin with, what is the ideal line? Well, it's the most geometrically perfect way to get a race car around a racetrack. Generally speaking, it involves being as wide as you possibly can and cutting corners to create as small of an angle as possible while maximizing the runoff on the exit of the road. So assuming that we're taking this corner at full speed, our brake marker is the one board exactly. So we would brake very hard in a straight line, maximizing the grip that we have for braking. As we turn into the apex, we'd start to let off the brake more and more and more and more as we head towards the apex denoted by that orange bollard. We would let off the brake completely and then gradually apply the power while maximizing the exit of the road. Now, I'm going to show you this at full speed down at T1. Our brake marker is denoted by the two last boards, the midpoint. Brake, drop two gears, lightly trail brake into the apex and then get on the power. Got on a little too early there and then brake at the gantry in a straight line and then let off, turn as you trail brake, coast, and then gradually on the power not to spin out on exit as you straighten up the wheel. And one more time. Always straighten the wheel as you apply the power and apply the power gently enough so the car doesn't spin out on you. All right, now, the reason that we trail brake is that maintaining a little bit of the car's weight on the front axle gives us more grip to turn with. It allows us to get through turns faster. Now watch as I take this turn. Watch the brake trace beneath me, the red bar. Look at that, all the way through, all the way through, keeping me right nestled into that corner. And again, massive trail brake section here, sector three of Brands Hatch. You begin by dabbing the brake as hard as you can and then letting off and then gradually on the power as you straighten the wheel. And again, rinse and repeat until you become an absolute master at this. If you want more detail about any of these techniques, I'm going to link an old video up above that I had from several months ago talking about how to drive fast that goes over all of these techniques in far more detail. Now that we've covered the most important aspects of getting you up to speed fast, it falls upon me to bring out some of the more folksy wisdom out there. After you've set up your sim rig, computer, and virtual car, learn the elementary basics of race car driving, and feel like you have some semblance of an idea of what you're doing, the next part of the equation is to make sure the time you spend driving is actually going to result in you getting faster. The way you do this is by ensuring that you're doing meaningful practice. By watching my friends drive on my sim rig and both literally and figuratively speaking, spin their wheels for hours, I came to realize that there has to be a goal behind your practice. If you're simply driving for the sake of driving without a clear cut path toward improvement, you're very likely not going to get much out of it. Most people erratically pick between different tracks and cars, driving each permutation for a few minutes before quickly getting bored and moving on to what's next. This is not the attitude that's going to get you into the top split. What you need to do is pick a class of car to specialize in. Ideally, even a single car within that class, which handles predictably from track to track. Then pick a track you're genuinely interested in. Now find all the alien level POV hot lap videos of people driving this track you can find. Study those videos for as long as you need in order to remember the racing line, brake markers, apexes, and general flow of the tracks. Now, get into your sim of choice and try to recreate those as closely as you can. Each lap, you should aim to get closer to the ideal brake points, improve the quality of your trail braking, and get closer to maximizing your delta on each corner. You need to do this not for 5 minutes, not for 15 minutes, but for hours. At a certain point, you'll naturally begin to fall off as your energy levels and focus deplete. This is the point at which you reach diminishing returns and often begin to internalize bad driving patterns. Use this as a chance to take a break. Watch the alien videos again, cross-reference what you've managed to achieve with what you've yet to achieve and give it a rest until next time. Gradually, with enough rinse and repeating, you'll find that over time you'll make very impressive gains with said car and track. So that takes care of the ideal line, hot lap portion of things, but still doesn't really help develop your racecraft. One easy way to get used to driving with other cars around and breaking away from the ideal line is by setting up a high level AI race. By the time you've run through our hot lap training circuit, you should be able to take on very fast AI. 
Simply run against the grid of these enough times to feel confident with other cars around you. Get used to racing hard but fair and avoid the urge to torpedo everyone up the inside. Once you feel confident among a full grid, take it to the internet. Your sim should have public lobbies which occasionally run tracks you know. Simply jump in there knowing you're likely to encounter some less than vigilant destruction derby warriors and that there's really not going to be too much at stake. Use this as a chance to get comfortable racing among human drivers. The great thing here is that you'll also be able to try to follow and keep up with faster drivers which will naturally give you a better idea of the limits of both track and car and where you've yet to improve. Rinse and repeat until you eventually win world's fastest gamer and become a real life race car driver. Well guys, I hope that was helpful to you. I'm confident these three major areas of study are going to take you from a relative newcomer to an absolute force to be reckoned with in the online leagues. Make sure to smash that sub to stay up to date with future sim racing tutorials, reviews and generally silly fun. Until next time, I'll see you guys later.